Okay, yeah, uh, okay, yeah, welcome. So uh, this time I'm uh, so happy, you know, to have everyone from different places. Professor So from US and uh, Yoga from Europe and uh, uh, Professor Osamu from Japan. All these three countries are very famous for micro and nano science and technology. And uh, both of your group has done a wonderful job and both of you, uh, you have done a wonderful job. Uh, now I have uh, some questions for, you know, uh, for you for this dialogue. So uh, Professor So already you know say uh, something now i have a question is to go to uh, uh yoga so yoga yeah i know your group was amazing because not only do you make a nanotechnology fabrication you do the device do the instrument and uh, the instrument that you made already go to the space is that right uh several years ago take the space shuttle go to the mars right Right, uh, there was a, a AFM on Mars where I was um, somehow involved in the developing of the prototypes, yes. So, well, well, can you tell us something about that project and what they did on the Mars? Uh, right, okay, so the mission was to send an atomic force microscope on Mars and take uh, images of samples that have been taken by the uh, robot, uh, and then uh, at the ultimate goal was to see if there's water on Mars. You know, this is a holy grail question that is still alive. So if you if you make a MAMS device that travels uh, through space onto Mars, there's uh, one important criteria to fulfill is reliability. You cannot go there and fix if something is not working. So the reliability was the most important uh, parameter. <clears throat> and uh, and redundancy, so you have maybe also a plan B in case there is a, a thing broken. So the idea was then basically to make an array of AFM cantilevers that could be exchanged by a robot on board of the last of the Mars lander. And it was a successful mission. At the end, there were uh, images taken by the AFM on Mars and they were sent to Earth and they have made great publications. So microengineering on Mars, that was it. We also have nice pictures. It was amazing, you know. Yeah, I'm so proud of you, you know, make this device go to the space. And uh, Professor Awesome, uh, uh, you from uh, Kyoto, Japan. Everyone knows that Japan, Japanese was so dedicated to be the, all these kind of things like fine arts. Oh my kind of nanotechnology with uh, so many kind of achievements from Japan is doing everything so, you know, beautiful, nice. And uh, not only the scientists, I saw all the students and, uh, you know, uh, even the staff, workers so who all were dedicated, doing a very nice job. Can you tell us some thank secret you. how you, you know, educated the students? Oh, okay, thank you for asking that question. Um, let me first, uh, talking about uh, Japan, after World War II, the Japan made a very good progress and everyone knows the Japan uh, industry had a great advancement and improvement. And in that sense, Japan is a kind of role model for many uh, developing countries. However, that phase, it was okay for the catch-up phase. However, in last 20 to 30 years, uh, we need a kind of innovation. And is that, that is a question that the, is Japanese really has done a good innovation and contribute to that uh, the phase. And the, the answer is uh, not really. Um, so, I, I think, and many people think the the Japanese uh, education system, especially university, has some uh, program to educate the people who can meet those kind of uh, the, the field to innovate uh, things. So that's why I, uh, I retired the Kyoto University last year, and uh, after that, I started work to a new university named Kyoto University of Advanced Science. And I'm now our founding dean of new engineering, a faculty of engineering. 
And this new faculty focus on the field of mechanical and electrical system engineering, which cover all the fields uh, between mechanical and electrical and information science and also electrochemistry. Because all those fields are the key fields for the new, in new innovation. For example, electrical vehicle, which needs all those fields. So I designed the, the new engineering school from the scratch, and we accepted first batch of students from this April. And one of the uniqueness of this uh, department, the number of students is 200. But in four years, half of them are international students. So 100 Japanese students and 100 international students. And we, we teach all the lectures in English. And also wow. we will uh, do the, have you heard about capstone? Capstone program is a kind of uh, training of the students. Uh, we ask, we, we collaborate with industry and ask industry to, pro to provide their, the real world problem they are facing now. And the student will attack these problems as a team of four students. And they will uh, try to attack those programs twice for the third year and the fourth year. And this strengthens the student's ability for the practical, uh, practical uh, knowledge and apply their real knowledge to the practical problem solving. So I think this kind of approach has never happened before in Japan. So in that sense, uh, we are now uh, starting a very new engineering school, which has never happened in Japan before. Wow, that's great. Great to hear these new stories. Because in China, you know, everyone was talking about the Japanese, you know, uh, doing all this kind of advanced work. Looks like you go advanced in the education again, you know, yeah, can get many more new things come out. Uh, actually, in this dialogue part, we collect some questions from, uh, you know, the audience. There is one uh, question is for Professor Su. Uh, so, Professor Su, the question, this one is for you. Uh, and you, uh, we're beginning at your talk, you mentioned that utilizing the brain and the computer interface, the people are able to acquire a lot of our knowledge in a short time instead of taking many years to study. Yeah. I think the human brain should be really only, and it is not advisable to directly write data to it. You know, physically, uh, manipulation can be used to treat neurological diseases, but not to change one's memory or mind. I want to, you know, have some kind of opinion on this. Yeah, is that clear? This is out my, uh, outside of my expertise. So, but, but uh, here's something uh, uh, simple. Um, so uh, how, it doesn't matter how wonderful brain is, it is made of water, ice, and molecules. There's no mystery to me. Uh, so, uh, and also uh, experiments have been conducted to influence, uh, to use, uh, uh, to put electrodes on two mice, two mice. So one mice, uh, one mouse is doing something can influence the other mouse. So I guess uh, influence people is just a matter of time. Okay, it is interesting because uh, this let me think about the education, you know. Now we still have need, uh, you know, many years for the students learning all these things. Like Professor Awesome, the new university is trying to push ahead, get the students, you know, in different uh, kind of topics can do some, uh, you know, projects to move forward. I think from micro nanotechnology, it's quite important. Uh, interesting because if we can combine the technology, you know, later with the education system or education technologies, then we can make something interesting. <laughs> yeah. I think the, <laughs> the micro technology can also contribute to education <laughs> itself. Yeah, yeah, the, for new sure. New technology can improve the, the education approaches. Definitely, it's true. 
Like now, we're using the new technologies to make this virtual communication. Yeah, <laughs> for the things. Okay, yeah, so uh, we also have some questions here. Uh, I think, you know, yeah, I want to, you know, get one question to Yogan. As uh, uh, Yogan, now, yeah, just hear your story about the space. So I think the most thing, uh, you know, you said is for the uh, device or instrument to go to the uh, the space, mm -hmm. uh, go out of, you know, this kind of, you know, uh, atmosphere areas. So it's the most important is the reliability, right? Is the stability or reliability of that. So uh, since during that time, when you do most work in the research lab, so how you collaborate with all these kind of, you know, astronomy the companies to make this reliability and this, all this kind of part work. So the collaboration from... Uh... Right. Okay, so um, as I said, I was only remotely part of that, but I know the story very well because it was uh, led by one of my colleagues, Dr. Urs, Professor Stauffer now and uh, Professor Nico de Roy. This was a major project that was coordinated by them and also with the European Space Agency. So they had the uh, right partners from the astrophysics and all the uh, space uh, uh, aeronautic engineers uh, in, in, the, in the team. So they knew exactly what the specification that they needed to build for an, uh, an instrument that goes into space. You can imagine there's a lot of acceleration that is happening during the launch and, uh, and then you go to a low gravity and everything is far away, so everything must be uh, perfectly, let's say, optimized uh, for this remote operation. But together with the experts from all the areas, uh, this was a fantastic team at that time, I remember, uh, to really uh, pull on the string and all in the same direction. <clears throat> okay, great. Yeah, so I think now is almost a time we need, you know, go to the second part of the uh, talk. So thank you all of you. I think yeah, this uh, dialogue is very interesting. I can exchange more ideas with our audience. And thank you very much. Uh, now it's awesome. You will be the guest host for Jürgen Brugger. Now it's your time you know, to introduce Jürgen. Stage is yours, please. Okay. Thank you, Alice. Okay. Let me chair the next session uh, will be given by Professor Jürgen Brugger. And first, let me introduce uh, Jürgen. Jürgen Bolgar is now a professor of microengineering and also the professor of material science at uh, EPFL. He has a rich experience at different countries. He, st he started from Switzerland, he got his PhD, and also he also working at the uh, University of Twente, Netherlands. And also he worked at IBM Zurich, uh, Switzerland. And also it was amazing that he had the experience to work at uh, Hitachi Central Research Lab in Tokyo. So as far as I know, he can speak very fluent Japanese, right? <laughs> well, Nihongo wa muskashi desu ne? And uh, I, 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 I couldn't remember when we met for the first time, but he's always uh, running ahead of me, and I always have been looking his his back, and he's a great uh, professor and researcher in uh, MEMS field. And today he will be talking about the uh, the gen gentle micro nano engineering for fragile material microsystems, which is about the soft materials, how how to publicate and how to. Uh, made the micro nano publication for those kind of uh, delicate materials. So let's welcome Jürgen Burger. Okay, let me share my screen and then. Uh, <clears throat> Can you see my screen? Um, no. Not come out yet. Yes. Yeah, come up. Is there? Yeah, it is. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Osama. So thank you for your kind words. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm. Uh, they go back to you because actually I felt like I was following you. You were inspiring me always with your work on the uh, fluidic self-assembly and the DNA uh, experiment. So thank you for your kind introduction. And also a great thanks to Alice. Alice uh, 
you have the built up here a community that is just extraordinary. I have been part of the ICANN community since many years, and uh, I, I enjoyed very much the physical meeting with all the students to go to the competition. Now we are all facing a, a global um, situation that is uh, preventing us from physically meeting, and uh, I think to have this chance to stay in contact and share our work with uh, the community is extraordinary. So thank you, Alice, for um, bringing and uh, organizing this, and it's a huge success. So I would like to, let me see my control browser is working. I want to give a, a presentation about the gentle microengineering, but I will spend a few uh, slides about uh, my school uh, and about microengineering in general. And then I will focus more about some manufacturing techniques that uh, uh, we and others are developing that are uh, particularly addressing the uh, shaping of fragile materials for MEMS and NAMPS. And I will also uh, present a couple of selected applications. And I think my talk uh, uh, actually is great. Uh, we had a previous talk uh, on all on the soft material uh, uh, um, systems because we actually also uh, looking very carefully about soft material and uh, I will not talk too much about the application themselves but rather about the engineering behind the, um, the, the manufacturing challenges that are behind to preserve the fragile materials that they are not damaged uh, during the, um, during the, the, uh, the, the processing. So briefly about my school EPFL. So we are in Switzerland. We are part of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology like the ETH in Zurich. So we are the sister institution. A quite large campus now. You see here a photo uh, at the shore of the Lake Geneva. Uh, you see the numbers of students and faculty and staff members. And we have uh, a couple of uh, schools that are focusing mainly on the polytechnical uh, aspects. And uh, one of the aspects uh, that we are uh, involved in is microengineering. And I want to show you here another photo of the campus, which is a fantastic ecosystem for students, uh, engineers, researchers, and also startup companies that uh, are in one uh, campus uh, location. So you see here, these are the buildings for uh, the technology. So this is the building where my office is, uh, the microengineering building with uh, central clean room, clean room facilities in the basement. Here we have a tech transfer and startup uh, uh, part of the campus. Uh, we have a conference center and student houses all in walking distance. I want to uh, also mention here in this period, teaching is not uh, physically possible uh, anymore. So um, everything is now switching to um, uh, remote uh, learning and uh, uh, you all know about uh, these uh, very popular um, MOOCs uh, and EPFL already has been an early adopter already um, many years ago to prepare MOOCs uh, for online teaching. And uh, we are now actually number one of MOOCs provider in Europe. So you're welcome to, the students are welcome to check the website on EPFL for the MOOC classes that we are offering. And the number is just growing, in particular in this uh, period where we cannot uh, go into the classroom. So, uh, EPFL and all our researchers and engineers, actually, we are uh, structuring our research into serving society. And uh, here are the six strategic uh, activities that the EPFL is uh, coordinating now on, uh, on, on larger platforms. So the first one is sustainability and energy. Then we have neuroscience, neuroengineering, health science and health technology as a center on imaging, intelligent systems and fundamental sciences. So I want to now zoom in a little bit into the area where I and my lab are active. And um, I want to make a little bit of a, a flashback in history. So um, microengineering is a, is a particular domain that is um, uh, traditionally very strong in Switzerland and surrounding countries like France and Germany. And it dates back to the 1800th century, the 18th century, where there was this famous robots that were made by uh, Jacques Hedroux. What you see here, these moving images, these moving uh, videos, are uh, showing a writer, a musician, and a draftsman. And they have been made purely by mechanical pieces. Uh, there was no electronic control. It was purely by 
uh, storing energy in mechanical uh, springs and then uh, uh, distributing the energy through the various parts of the uh, of the uh, uh, small robot. And of course, this was for uh, the high society at the time, the royals, as a gift. Uh, and but it, it shows uh, uh, the tradition that has then led in the later uh, decades and century to the precision engineering uh, for which Switzerland is uh, very well known for, in particular for the mechanical watches uh, that you can see one example here. Very complex mechanics, all uh, only based on mechanics without any electronic control. And this has formed the basis for a lot of products that uh, uh, we are all benefiting today uh, for high precision uh, sensors uh, or production uh, tools for solar panels, here's uh, for dispensing tools, atomic force microscopes that uh, were just mentioned before in the dialogue, et cetera, et cetera. Here's uh, uh, sensors uh, uh, for uh, monitoring uh, air pressure and optical MEMS device, and uh, last but not least, the mechanical watches. So this is the basis. And uh, before I go now in the, in the heart, part of my lecture, I would like to also acknowledge first my team. And this is a photo that we took uh, uh, late last year. And normally we meet on the campus and as we know all now, we are uh, uh, staying at home. So basically we have our meetings now all online using uh, home offices. And uh, but as we speak, uh, and since last week now, the campus at EPFL is uh, slowly opening again in a reduced uh, uh, set, of course, uh, only one third of the personal staff can go to campus. And every student who comes gets a personal safety kit, which has masks and a sanitizer uh, liquid to, uh, uh, to keep um, uh, hygienic measures uh, uh, clean. So I normally forget this always at the end of my talk, so I would really like to thank all my students uh, in the, for the past years and also the current group members uh, because they have been doing all the work that I will show now and I would also like to uh, acknowledge all the funding that have uh, uh, made this uh, this work uh, possible in particular from the European Commission and also the Swiss National Science Foundation and other strategic funding schemes that uh, gives us the sponsor for doing our work. So now let's uh, have a look uh, at uh, what we are doing and uh, how I see this field about uh, engineering fragile uh, materials uh, with uh, soft techniques or gentle techniques. What you see here is uh, basically showing uh, the difference between the left side, a well-established approach that we all know, uh, which uh, is based on silicon wafers, which uh, includes sometimes very harsh processes, but well-established. On the right side is the emerging uh, techniques uh, that we want to do if you talk about soft materials. So there's definitely a big difference in terms of uh, throughput, reliability. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I think my, my PowerPoint has just crashed. Let me start it again. Yeah, sure. You're good. Yeah, please try again. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll try. I don't know what happened. Uh, my PowerPoint just crashed. Okay. Yeah, I'll come back. Are we back? Yeah, come back. Okay, so let me scroll down. Where we I will not show the video again because this has maybe caused uh, the issue. So those who are in this area of MEMS and NEMS uh, since many years, they remember this landmark paper from uh, Kurt Peterson uh, presenting silicon as mechanical material 30 years ago. And uh, everything then has been fo uh, focused also for MEMS uh, using uh, silicon, and then there was this trend to go to uh, thinner uh, films, new materials, and higher resolution. And about 10 years ago, we see the emergence of 2D materials and more and more polymer, not only as a resist material for microsystems, but also as a structural 
material for microsystems or like for organic electronics uh, as electric, electrically functional material. So today the toolbox, uh, there's a new toolbox that we are developing and that we actually need uh, with materials and tools to fabricate functional uh, micro nano devices. And, um, and uh, this is the last slide to introduce the general concept. And um, I think it's always also interesting to see uh, the, uh, what is actually technology providing as a push and where's the need for an application that pulls uh, a technology. And in the past uh, decades, and we can safely say that the driver was definitely CMOS for automotive IT uh, application. They have been always asking, and for memory, so they've always been asking for higher density and higher functionality, higher integration. Today, it looks like there's a, a clear drive uh, coming from healthcare devices, um, uh, implantables and wearables. And uh, in the previous uh, seminars, there was also this uh, fantastic talk by John Rogers, and uh, so we all know about the need for this uh, area of application. And so what I want to say here basically is that uh, we really need um, to work uh, more on f f um, solving these challenges in material shaping and integration, because we're far away from uh, a robust and uh, cost efficient manufacturing for these fragile uh, soft materials. But we're on the way, we're at the beginning, but um, we have still a long way to go. So in this talk, I want to present basically three techniques that uh, we are developing since quite some time in my laboratory. But these are all lithography that do not use any harsh process steps. Nano stenciling, capillary assembly, and thermal scanning probe lithography. And then after introducing these techniques, I will also present a couple of um, landmark applications that we have launched that are very challenging from the manufacturing point of view and the design point of view, but they can, some of them part, uh, partially benefit from these techniques plus the, all the other techniques that we have available in the clean room, such as printers and, um, and embossing tools. So let's talk about nano stenciling first. So nano stenciling is a high resolution sh shadow mask technique. So you see here a four inch wafer that is a stencil Everything that is uh, pink color here is a very thin membrane in silicon nitride with uh, holes that have been uh, micro-machined by lithography and etching. Now, you can, if you can imagine using this um, stencil as a shadow mask, you put it in contact with another wafer, and then you can do direct and vacuum clean patterning without using any photoresistance. Here's an animation. Hopefully, it runs smoothly, yes. So how this is working, so this stencil can be used for local deposition, but it can also be used for local etching. And this is what I have uh, said here in this uh, list of uh, opportunities. It's not only limited to locally adding material, it can be used for etching and also iron implantation without using any photoresist. So it has uh, allows the full toolbox to actually create integrated uh, devices by these uh, three um, generic process uh, methods. There are challenges, and uh, this, we all know about it. We have uh, summarized this in a review paper a couple of years ago by Oscar, who's now a professor in UCLA, uh, in uh, UC San Diego, sorry. So all the challenges and opportunities are highlighted in this paper, and uh, some of them uh, can be easily solved if you uh, take care in how to design the stencil. I'll show you a couple of examples uh, that are showing the power of this technique. So this was one of the first paper that we made with Oscar about a nanowire uh, sensor that was uh, simply made by shadow depositing uh, a nanowire of metal on a surface through the uh, slits of a, a nano stencil. So one can uh, now fabricate a uh, large array of uh, nanowires without having to do e beam lithography and without having to use any uh, photoresist or developing, which we know always has a certain risk to contaminate uh, the material. So in case these materials are fragile uh, and would not support any corrosive uh, process steps, 
Stenciling is a, is a very convenient way to do it on, a, on an interesting length scale. You can see here, we can easily break the 100 nanometer length scale, which is otherwise quite challenging to do with a simple lithography techniques. Another example I want to uh, show here is another paper that came a little bit later. It's basically showing that uh, the stencil can deposit also metal structures directly on a polymer. Imagine you have here polymer like polyimide, SU8, perylene, or PDMS. These are sometimes surfaces that are very challenging or impossible to, uh, to, to, to pattern with metal. But with the high resolution uh, stencil, this uh, appears to be very easy and very reliable and very reproducible. So these are nanodots that have been uh, deposited, nanodots of metal, titanium and gold in this case, directly on the, on the polymer, and then they have been uh, analyzed as candidate for plasmonic biosensing. Now, I want to highlight another opportunity for stenciling, and this is, um, I need uh, maybe a, a few more arguments here to convince you. Uh, when we look at this drawing here on the right side, you see here in green is the shadow mask, the stencil that blocks the incoming flux of the uh, atoms or the molecules. Here's the opening where the molecules and atoms are actually reaching the surface. And this is where they will deposit and, and condense. But there's always a diffusion laterally underneath the stencil, which is protected from the flux of the next incoming uh, uh, atom and or molecules. So by exploiting this lateral diffusion, one can now have a system which actually is based here on uh, pentacene organic molecules, which we know that we, we look for those to have large crystals, uh, to have a high mobility for organic electronic applications. But if you do a planar PVD deposition, you always get um, uh, very small crystals because they don't have the time to grow without being uh, disturbed by other incoming deposition. So here the experiment was very simple. It was uh, using a stencil that has a big opening, 10 micrometer, and another stencil which has very small opening, one micrometer. And here is the corresponding uh, uh, film that has been formed. So here the thickness is uh, six angstrom. So it's not completely covering, but you see already there's some um, uh, structure of the pentacene that forms. And here is uh, the structure that has been deposited through uh, a one micrometer hole. And if you look now with the AFM, the morphology, you see here for this area, there is a, a polycrystalline um, structure. That means the uh, crystal is not very big and the mobility will not be very high. But if you look at uh, those flakes that have been grown of the organic molecule Behind that opening, the shadow mask, it looks, uh, they are very crystalline because they have been grown laterally and protected from the stencil, um, uh, from the flux of the next incoming um, uh, uh, molecules. So with the stencil, one can basically fine tune the flux and give the crystal more time to grow and form larger flakes. That's the message of this experiment and can be uh, read by these papers that we did together with the colleagues at IMEC uh, in, uh, in Belgium. I will quickly uh, now uh, switch topic. I will now talk about the other technique that is capillary assembly. A capillary assembly is based on the fluidic um, mean to transport prefabricated uh, micro or nano particles to a specific location. So. The key is here to make a deterministic landing and uh, positioning of particles and uh, to see how scalable this technique becomes as a bottom-up nanofabrication. And the other asset that uh, uh, is interesting to uh, maintain and to keep in mind is that uh, pre-synthesized nanocrystals are pristine material. They have a superior quality in terms of electronic, optical, or magnetic property compared to a thin film that you then chop in pieces by doing e-beam or etching. So let's have a look at um, a nice um, video that was made by um, still at Ali Langmuir. It shows a drying uh, drop of a colloidal 
a solution with uh, micro beats, and you see these beats are all rushing to the edge, which then leads at the end to the well-known uh, coffee staining effect and the, um, the coffee ring. So, uh, so this is basically showing the potential to deliver small amounts of materials in a fluidic to a given location. Also here, it's completely chaotic and um, un uncontrolled. So how can we control this? And uh, we and others, we have uh, worked on that by building an instrument that is controlling this evaporation that is happening at the edge of a um, drying liquid drop. So it's, it's, it's similar to a blade coating. And what you see here is a um, colloidal suspension in blue that is um, under a transparent uh, uh, glass plate and on a substrate that has a prefabricated topographical uh, uh, traps. And now if, if you look, uh, the, the system itself looks a little bit uh, uh, like this. So we have a controlled motion stage and we have also the Peltier element to control temperature and uh, the humidity in this area, which is very important. And here in this movie, you see now what's happening when you drag this liquid drop that is full with colloidal nanoparticles across, across the uh, template surface. Uh, that um, what we will see later that from this area we deposit these nanoparticles into these prefabricated traps and then we look at them under the microscope. So it's a scalable uh, technique. Uh, at this point, a couple of millimeters and centimeters have been uh, demonstrated. So this is a cartoon showing what is going on. This is the substrate with, which has uh, uh, traps that are fabricated by previous uh, um, nanofabrication techniques. So these are typically 50, 100 nanometer wide. And the colloidal solution is, is full of uh, gold nanorods or gold nanoparticles. And when the, the, the meniscus is pulled by moving this glass plate, there is a, a evaporation happening at the edge of this liquid uh, glass interface which makes all the particles rushing to the border and then they can be delivered uh, into these traps. Now, how well this filling of traps can be controlled is something we had a closer look because as you see here, the, the deterministic position and the orientation is not that perfect. And it's simply the fact that these rods are slightly smaller than the traps. So inside the trap, they have a certain degree of freedom and when the liquid evaporates, uh, the last uh, force that is acting on the, uh, uh, the meniscus force, uh, which determines basically how these uh, rods will end up uh, at the end when everything is dry. So this is not ideal for some application that uh, we have in mind. So we had to do some uh, tricks. And the first trick was to make the traps having a um, funnel shape. You see here now the, in the, the zoom here shows the funnel. That means the particle gets trapped into one of these uh, uh, traps, in fact. It is also um, locked in a given position and it cannot rotate. So you see now, if I go back, now the orientation is, uh, is, is, is really perfect. They're all horizontal. There's none of them that has an, uh, an angle that is uh, not horizontal. But here we already gained a lot of control simply by having a, a trap uh, more elaborate. And then the last uh, improvement was to make a, a, a auxiliary uh, structure that helps pinning the liquid before it retracts. And this has improved drastically the yield of this technique. So by optimizing these traps, one can get uh, close to 100 yield of uh, nanorod uh, delivery into um, prefabricated traps at a relatively large uh, area. And we also did here an optimization to, to get control about the nano gap. And this is essential for studies using plasmonic or tunneling devices. Uh, so by, by having another auxiliary structure in the trap, as is shown here, we can now decide if you want to have the particles to be fused together or they have a very uh, narrow gap or a well-defined gap in the order of five, more than 10 and up to 100 nanometer. So everything can now be deterministically designed and fabricated. 
And then uh, we have a lot of freedom, of course, about the uh, variety of uh, design. And this shows an example that uh, it's not linked only to uh, horizontal uh, features, but also can be used for uh, quite arbitrary geometries in, in various angles. And this gives interesting property uh, from metamaterial uh, studies. Okay, the, um, one more example I, I wanted to show um, uh, about the, the liquid uh, manufacturing of uh, devices. And this is actually work that we did together with uh, uh, Peking University last year. Uh, it always has been shown before about transparent electronics. And uh, what we see here is um, uh, the, the need of making uh, electronic uh, layers on transparent substrates. So, uh, when we put more uh, conducting material, in this case it's a conducting nanomaterial, uh, it gets more opaque. But if we have a certain geometry that I will show you in the next slide, it can get sufficient conductivity and maintaining the transparency very high. And the trick basically is, is to, to come up with a configuration at the end that uh, has a conducting material, not only on the flat part, but also on the side wall part, like you see here in this uh, drawing. So these are suspension of uh, conducting nanomaterial. They have been deposited by a liquid uh, Langmuir type of um, approach where this film of nanomaterial that was floating on the water-air interface has been transferred onto the surface of, um, of a PDMS uh, mesh and then upon drying and breaking of this uh, capillary, the loaded material was then uh, deposited on the side wall. So now the conduction actually is provided not only by this narrow part of the transparent device, but also by uh, the side wall. And the transparency, of course, is maintained because only here we have eventually opaque uh, um, layers uh, that would prevent the transmission to be uh, optimal. The second or the next example I want to present now in the toolbox of uh, uh, micro and nanofabrication is uh, thermal scanning probe lithography. So thermal scanning probe lithography is basically a uh, atomic force microscope where the, the tip can be heated. And you see on the left side a optical image of such a device. So this is the silicon cantilever that is uh, flexible to probe the surface. And this glowing bit is the tip that is now uh, very hot, up to 1,000 degrees C, that can be heated by simply passing a current through the dope, the legs, and uh, back out into the holder. So what is the key of this technique is following, that since this mass is extremely small, uh, the thermal mass is extremely small, it gives access to ultra fast heating and cooling rates in the microsecond uh, uh, range, which is otherwise impossible at this length scale to reach. So we're talking about 10 nanometer resolution, extremely fast heating and extremely co uh, fast cooling. And uh, we will see later that uh, when we used it for lithography, we do not have uh, need, we don't need any charged particle beam like electron beam or ion beam. And this gives a certain advantage when we consider structuring fragile materials that otherwise would be damaged by the trapped charges or the high energy of the beam. And if you want to know more that I cannot show everything in this uh, talk, there's a video paper that uh, uh, has been just published uh, a month ago in uh, Microsystems Nano Engineering, which shows a lot of uh, insights about this technique. And there's one paper that we are now publishing soon, which addresses this technique uh, for patterning uh, 2D materials. So the hot tip you can see here basically is an uh, artistic uh, representation can be used for removal material. If this film here uh, sublimates under the heat, it can create uh, openings in that material, and that is what is typically done by using a, uh, a thermosensitive uh, polymer. So one can remove material very clean without any subsequent uh, process steps. One can create topography contrast, and it's uh, of course relies on a specific thermosensitive resist, which has been developed particularly for this uh, uh, application. 
But a hot tip can also be used for conversion of material. So if this film here is sensitive to heat, one can use now the heat from the tip to locally uh, create phase changes or induce chemical reaction only locally where we have the tip in contact or near the, near the surface at the uh, high resolution. And uh, last but not least, another variation that has been already also proposed and presented is to locally add material uh, because uh, you may remember the DPEN uh, technology that used uh, uh, inks at room temperature to be deposited to write patterns of molecules. Here, since uh, the tip is heated, it can rely on material that is solid at room temperature and upon heating it melts and can then uh, by melt transfer from the tip be delivered uh, to, to the surface. So uh, the key feature of this technology actually is that it's a closed loop nano patterning. What does that mean, closed loop? It means that we can directly see uh, what has been written. It's sometimes or uh, mostly not even possible with the normal lithography that you have first to go to development and then go into the microscope to see the result. Here, uh, the AFM that is used for right in, in, from left to right is the same AFM that is then used to read from right to left. So one sees immediately uh, how uh, accurate the pattern is and can uh, fine tune the parameters to optimize the process uh, quality. So this is a unique feature that has now been um, commercialized since many years by, by companies with Lito and they have now joined recently uh, with Heidelberg Instruments to combine the laser writing uh, uh, and the uh, thermal scanning probe uh, writing in one instrument. I want to show two or three examples that are unique uh, in, uh, in um, nanoengineering soft materials using this technique. And the first one is uh, silk. It knows silk very well. It's an uh, excellent material for many interesting uh, applications uh, in, in biomedicine and, um, and in particular for implants or for sensors. So uh, silk has an interesting property is that uh, it uh, has two configurations where one of them is water soluble and the other one is water insoluble. And uh, the change from one to the other can be triggered by a local, uh, uh, by, by, by heat basically, by, by melting um, the silk. So what we, what we have done here is um, speed coating a silk film on a silicon wafer. And the first silk configuration was that we had a crystalline uh, structure that is water insoluble. But when we come with the hot tip, we locally warm up the silk, which creates then the random coil configuration, which itself becomes water uh, soluble. And after writing, we put this sample into a water um, uh, base and uh, basically uh, develop by water the um, the, the written silk pattern. And here you can see uh, the result uh, where we have here uh, an AFM image of the silk after writing the pattern. So there's a, a small contrast can be seen, but it's hardly, if you see the scale bar here, it's in the order of a couple of nanometer, two, three nanometer. And once it has been put in the water, we see then the contrast is extremely in, uh, enhanced, uh, uh, nearly down to 100 nanometer, saying that the heat from the tip has converted the crystalline silk into amorphous silk down to this depth. Another example I want to uh, show here is uh, uh, that we pursued together with colleagues from uh, the Adolf Merkel Institute in uh, Fribourg in Switzerland. They are expert in uh, stimuli responsive thermochromic films. So these are supermolecular polymers that can have uh, more than one fluorescent uh, state. And these are interesting features as a hidden security feature. And what you see here, for example, is that by uh, with the heated uh, AFM tip, we can locally write in the polymer, a feature that changes the, the fluorescence from uh, red to green. And because the heat 
the cooling rate is so high we can quench the fluorescence of this um, molecule in the green state and then retrieve it later with a fluorescent uh, microscope. And here you see a little bit more of details. Uh, I don't want to go uh, too much here because that uh, would uh, take too much time. But what is important to notice here is that um, the key asset, this technique is that we have here the polymer that is uh, red fluorescent. Now we come at room temperature is red fluorescent and at uh, 180 degrees it becomes uh, green fluorescent. So we come now with the hot probe. We locally expose the polymer to a, a heat, which then converts it from red to green fluorescent. And then normally when we cool down, it would turn back to the red fluorescence. But because we can do that extremely fast in the micro, microsecond um, uh, range, we are quenching now these, um, these molecules in the green fluorescent state. And this gives us the contrast that we saw on the image before that is still uh, in a green state, also we are now back to room temperature. Okay, the last example is the most recent one. Um, you all know that um, for micro nanosystems and 2D materials are seen as uh, potential candidates for future nanosystems. Also, there's a lot of problems still in terms of uh, uh, reliability and manufacturing, but I think uh, many people are working towards and uh, there's no doubt that uh, 2D materials will have a path into uh, advanced nanosystem. So not only graphene, but also uh, MOS2, MOT2. You know, there are only one or few atom sticks, so they're extremely challenging to pattern because there's always a risk of contamination and damaging. So. Very recently, and this is a paper that is yet to come out in a, in a few weeks by Xialu and the other co-workers from my laboratory. So we have been able to directly nanocut 2D materials. And how do we do that? Uh, we look here on this cross-section of the uh, experiment. We have the substrate that is coated with the thermosensitive polymer PPA. And then there is a flake of 2D material trans, uh, transported um, onto that uh, surface. And now we come with the hot tip from the TSPL AFM. And because the heat will penetrate also through the 2D, 2D layer, which is very thin. And by pressing, we are able to break the bonds of this 2D uh, layer. And then the heat will make the PPA, which is thermosensitive, sublimate and basically evaporate into the vacuum. So by doing so, we can now create very clean cuts in 2D material uh, by using this uh, technique without having to do any e lithography or any uh, resist developing and uh, chemical steps. And uh, here you see some uh, features that we have been doing as part of the paper that will come out soon, just showing the versatility of the patterning control and we have also uh, managed to um, cut uh, um, a uh, electronic, uh, let's say, um, a nano wire, a nano ribbon, and uh, measure the transport property, which are a scale, which are scaling well with the dimension. So we can really say that we have a very clean and um, and flexible nano cutting technique for for two D materials uh, that will be published uh, in a couple of weeks in, the, in this journal. Okay, I think I will skip this. So um, I will now uh, I will now stop talking about the um, the uh, engineering techniques. I will now briefly focus on each of these um, applications that we are pursuing in my laboratory. They only as a subsection, but I have no time to uh, present all of them. But um, just a few uh, typical examples. So one application that uh, we are having a project on is um, implantable drug release capsule. So the idea is that we can, uh, after a knee surgery, uh, implant into the body a, a micro capsule that holds drugs and that can be released during a certain amount of time as a painkiller and anti-inflammatory uh, drug. And uh, the, the goal is is to, to make a uh, multi-reservoir that is filled with drug and by an external device, 
we can trigger which of these um, uh, capsules we would like to open. And how we are doing that is that we are uh, designing on the capsule membrane uh, RLC resonators, which are basically uh, metal, in this case magnesium antennas, that are picking up the energy from an incoming RF um, uh, electromagnetic field, which induces a current and then creates a hotspot in one part of the antenna, which then melts the membrane and opens a pore so that the drug can be released. And uh, the capsule detail are shown here. So it's basically a uh, molded uh, plastic uh, uh, capsule, which has uh, up to 10 or more reservoirs. And on top is, is the membrane, very thin membrane with the uh, magnesium antenna. And then uh, the idea is then here, the hotspot would melt the membrane and then the drug can be, uh, can be escaping from the inner part of the membrane uh, of the drug capsule into the, the body. And the scenario would be to have every day a, a, a given dose released or even having a different drugs at the different uh, schedule that is needed for the um, biomedical uh, application. And everything is uh, dissolvable, it's magnesium. So here you see the test that sees that uh, when exposing it to water uh, environment, it uh, vanishes, it disappears. And the idea is, uh, in fact, that the entire capsule is made of biodegradable polymer. So after the uh, two weeks or three weeks mission in the knee, the capsule will dissolve and there will be no secondary surgery needed to open uh, and remove the, the device. I want to also mention um, a work that uh, has to do again with polymer um, uh, fabrication and, uh, and uh, 3D shaping and integration. It's about polymer uh, travel electro uh, uh, generator and power MEMS. And you see here uh, the situation uh, in the past. Uh, people were reading newspapers in uh, the train and there was no need for power. Uh, but today everyone has smart devices and we need power uh, power them and we do not want to carry battery all the time. So, and of course there's this uh, a lot of activity in uh, tribal electric energy harvesting. So we also had an interesting collaboration with the Peking University and Tokyo University with Shaosheng Zhang, who was the lead uh, scientist behind making a uh, tribal electric generator uh, based on silk material that then can generate uh, uh, power to, uh, uh, for, re for remote powering portable devices. So this is an extremely uh, relevant and exciting topic and a lot of work is going on, but all in all it needs um, still improvement in uh, the material processing and manufacturing to make these uh, soft materials uh, reliable and also cost efficient. Another example from a collaboration we had with uh, a group in, uh, in Korea, uh, it's uh, also an interesting uh, challenge um, uh, where uh, polymer or advanced manufacturing is uh, making a difference. Assuming you have lost your, uh, your uh, hearing uh, ability, so uh, sometimes you can uh, use a hearing aid, but in some cases you have to stimulate your uh, hearing nerves, and this is done by a cochlear implant, which is then directly interfacing with the nerves in your inner ear. And these are typically devices that look like that. They are very, very well established today. The problem is that they also create some inflammatory uh, reaction, and um, which is, uh, can be very dangerous. So there's one solution out of that is to have a drug eluting, a steroid, steroid eluting um, implant. So the challenge is to store enough drug so it can be released over a certain period of time when already implanted. And here, this is what we did together with a group in South Korea. So Jung Moon Jang was the lead author. Is using a two photon uh, printer, uh, Nanoscribe, to make a scaffold around the flexible electrode array. And then later on, by loading this scaffold with the injured printer uh, with the drug, so in these pores, the drugs are then stored 
and are slowly diffusing out into the uh, into the electrode to prevent uh, inflammation uh, after insertion of the implant. So another nice example where advanced uh, uh, micro and uh, printing techniques bring solutions for a very relevant uh, challenge in the biomedical uh, application. Last but not least, I want to show another example that we are now still working on is about um, uh, pacemaker um, implants. So on the left side, you see the first pacemaker from the 1970s. So you see here the patient. We had the honor to be the first one to get a uh, pacemaker implanted. And this uh, is the control electronics of the uh, basically this stimulation device he needed to carry himself outside. And then the pacemaker was implanted in the heart. And uh, so what you see here is a RX X-ray image of a more modern device where you see the battery and the device and the leads that go into the heart muscle. But the problem is with these implants that there's always a risk of inflammation. And today, uh, these, met these uh, uh, electrodes are made from metal. And it is known that metals can release some ions, and uh, it's suspected that they can contribute to uh, the fibrosis growth. So we have been looking together with others if we can make conducting polymer electrodes like S-weight, the glassy carbon, or polymer-derived ceramics as a candidate for implanting a pacemaker into the heart and having less fibrosis inflammation over time. So we did uh, all the development for making uh, microelectrodes, uh, pacemaker electrodes in different polymer materials. This is as weight. And then when you uh, uh, center it, it gets glassy carbon. Or you can also do uh, with uh, other polymer derived ceramics precursors and get conducting ceramics, which are chemically inert and do not have any ionic exchange with the surrounding. I think I will skip this one in view of uh, interest and time. So what we did at, in, uh, in, a, in the past collaboration um, is actually also then studying the, um, the, how these uh, electrodes are able to pace um, uh, heart cells. So here is an in vitro experiment where we have a, a Petri dish, where we have the electrodes that are made now by, uh, by uh, PDC or by the polymerized ceramics or by the uh, SUA. And then we have here cardinal myocytes that are cultured in that, uh, in, that uh, in vitro um, dish. We look with the optics and then we have here a signal generator that uh, creates a pacing signal from one electrode to the other. And since the current is flowing here, this, we expected that the, this current will stimulate the cardiomyocytes to beat. And this is what you see here in these uh, two videos. You can see the cardiomyocytes that are now at the bottom of this Petri dish, but they are pacing because they are exposed to the current that is going from one implant uh, from one um, uh, disc to the other and basically shows that in principle in vitro this uh, technique uh, is validated and then later we had a, a collaboration with a, a university hospital he also did some uh, animal testing and in vivo and uh, I, we did um, cytotoxicity tests to see if the implants actually are benign or if they create some uh, fibrosis so there's some fibrosis, but this is as expected for any uh, physical insert in a living tissue. But there's no more fibrosis um, uh, around it compared to uh, the other materials. And actually, it uh, looks like it's even better than for some of the other uh, materials that are typically used. And then there was an experiment that we did with a uh, open heart, uh, you know, with an explanted heart. So. Uh, I know we all scientists and we do not mind seeing these images, but if someone is sensitive to blood and a heart beating, then maybe look away for a few seconds. And what you see here is a experiment that was done on an explanted heart with implanted uh, uh, ceramic microelectrodes. So you see uh, when we start pulsing, the, the heart follows the frequency of our pulse rate. And if we stop pulsing, it uh, just uh, slows down and does uh, the pulse by its natural frequency. So proof of concept that, uh, that 
the, the stimulation of um, a, um, a tasting signal is possible uh, via the uh, conducting polymer implant uh, electrode that we have designed before. Okay, last but not least, I think uh, my time is also uh, soon up. I did not really check the time. Uh, I want to show briefly something more decorative and useful as a security feature. So if you, if you have once taken a $100 bill in your hands uh, recently, you see in the center the security ribbon, which is basically, if you tilt it, you see a, a changing image, uh, which is based on a, on a moiré effect. And we have been quite some work on, together with colleagues in, um, in computer science to calculate the moiré features and see how we can translate these um, very interesting uh, images at the micro scale by using micro technology and uh, lithography. So typical morays, you know them all. On the left side, you see simply a, a very dark one uh, that is a, a changing beating pattern by having lines or dot areas that are overlapping. The, uh, the one in the center is uh, another uh, moray effect that uh, has a more in interesting uh, uh, optical effect by, by beating patterns and by, by sliding and rotating patterns. And then on the other, uh, the other one is another example that shows very interesting uh, uh, geometrical features also uh, by level line more. So what we did with uh, uh, one of uh, my students also that we were uh, seeing if we can make a transparent uh, more the previous ones were uh, not really uh, transparent and clear, so one had to rely on uh, either very strong illumination or reflection. But to, to make a transparent micromarine, one needs a transparent substrate. And here we developed a, a, a technology that we have on both sides, uh, micro lenses that have been uh, fabricated by lithography and the reflow technique and molding. And then having uh, basically the moiré effect uh, uh, not by uh, a change of opaque and transparent layer, but by having a micro-optical lensing effect, uh, and of course, well calculated as a function of the, um, uh, the, the size of the lenses and the thickness of the transparent substrate. So, and you see here on the right side is that you get a, a nice uh, moiré effect. Now, not by sliding the two elements together by basically by tilting and uh, show it again. So this is very useful for not only decorative, but also for uh, safety and security features integrated in a, in, in, in a very precious uh, um, products. And here's the last one showing uh, the Rolex Learning Center, which is uh, one of the buildings on our campus, which is the library. Uh, you see it's nicely transparent and uh, it gives an idea how you could eventually think about your, your windows or uh, shop to make advers uh, advertising for people walking by and having a message that is being displayed. Okay, I will come to the end. I will just to mention for all those students now that uh, who are listening, I mentioned in the beginning that um, MOOCs, online courses, are extremely helpful uh, in, in general, but in particular in this period where we cannot go into the classroom. And I have been involved uh, uh, with one of my colleagues at EPFL uh, to launch already a couple of years ago a MOOC, which is focusing on micro nanofabrication. And it basically shows the fundamentals of fabrication technology but also taking the camera into the clean room so the students can see actually the tools and the techniques as we fabricate the devices and uh, do lithography and etching and thin film deposition. So this course is uh, available. You can go to this website from edx.org. And I think uh, it starts actually today. Looks like it's today to start a new session. And uh, so you may be interested to have a look if the content is of interest to you you can register and follow the online class. Then once again, I would like to conclude now here and thank again all the former and present group members in my laboratory who have been mainly doing the work that I have now presented. 
And uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank you for the attention and I wish everyone to, to stay safe, stay healthy and keep safe. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all again. Thank you for a nice, great talk uh, covering many different topics uh, from nano stencil to the capillary assembly, thermal scanning probe lithography, and several different applications. Alice, where can Hi. I have our? Uh, uh, yeah, you can have the question there. Yeah, the first okay. question. Okay, yeah, here it is. Here it goes. I cannot see. <laughs> can you see that? No. No, I can't oh. see anything. Okay, now I read the first question. Okay, yeah. So, uh, uh, this yes, is the first read it. question. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, please. Okay, oh, uh, okay. I don't know which university, but uh, thanks a lot for your wonderful talk. The nano stencil technique is very interesting and powerful for nano patterning. Oh, it, okay. Does it still work very well for soft materials such as polymeric substrate? Any challenges? Okay, that's a very good question. And um, as, I, as I said, the stencil um, in principle does not need to be in contact with the substrate. So in principle, uh, depending on the resolution that uh, one is aiming at, one can actually uh, keeping a small gap between the stencil and a, uh, a, a substrate. So even soft materials like polymers uh, are candidates. And I have shown some examples in my talk with the plasmonic uh, dots for the biosensor that have been deposited on PI, PDMS, pyrrolene, et cetera. So yes, uh, stenciling is a, is a very strong candidate for uh, putting uh, structures and materials on top of polymer because they would not su survive a traditional lithography etching step. But with stencil, it is pretty straightforward. So I would uh, encourage you to try and uh, it's, it's not that difficult to actually achieve interesting results in a relatively short term. So what are the challenges? Uh, great. Yeah, challenge. Are there any yes. big challenge? For the stenciling? Yeah. The stencil challenge is following uh, um, that the stencil, of course, uh, picks up all the material that is not deposited through the holes. So the membrane uh, gets thicker and uh, might break at some point. Also, mm -hmm. the holes get clogged by the, mm -hmm. by the uh, material. So all depends on the size we're talking about. But in all cases, it is very straightforward to clean the stencil and to recycle. So once the stencil has been made, it can be used a certain time and then has to be uh, recycled by cleaning. But this is uh, also quite uh, straightforward to do. And the other uh, challenge is, is uh, which I did not address, and but is, which is, can be important, is alignment. We all want to do uh, normally multi-layer fabrication, not just one layer. So if you want to or need to align the stencil very precisely to a prefabricated pattern, there needs to be a dedicated tool that can uh, can allow to do that. And in principle, mask aligners, which are already very good in aligning masks, photo masks to wafers, can be used by modifying uh, the chuck. And so even alignment down to one micrometer for a uh, four-inch wafer is not impossible. Could you give me okay. a typ typical, typical gap? Uh, sorry, could you give me a typical gap between stencil and substrate? Okay, so you can go in contact or you have to uh, create some spaces that you design around uh, your apertures and then you have uh, the exact gap of your spacer. Now the problem is following, if you, if you take two rigid surfaces, they are never perfectly flat because they have been polished and they are warping and they are not uh, smooth, uh, atomically flat and smooth. So having two rigid surfaces everywhere in contact is not easy unless you extremely press hard. And this is something we do not want to do. So the exact knowledge of the gap 
unfortunately is not that trivial. It can vary from uh, a, a micrometer up to 10 micrometer on a typical silicon wafer. Okay, Professor Tabata, this is yeah, yeah, move to the next. Yeah. Move to the Can next I... topic. Question. Yeah. Okay, second question is uh, the, for the pattern on silk. How about the resolution and the stability? Can it be applied for other, other woven materials? Okay, that's a very interesting question, Oliver. Um, so what I showed was the ultimate scale of patterning uh, silk with the uh, uh, hot AFM tip. So this was, at this point, more, let's say, an academic uh, uh, experiment to see what is the resolution and the possibility. Now, if you talk about uh, other woven materials, um, if you have a woven material that uh, has a phase change uh, between two temperature regimes, then it's a candidate. Uh, to also try out. Um, I'm not familiar with other woven materials, how they actually behave uh, under uh, these thermal treatments. We have been solely looking at the silk because the silk was uh, needed for another application and we were curious to learn more about the thermal property of silk uh, at this uh, sub-micron scale. So I'm sorry, I cannot answer for other woven materials uh, myself. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, let's move to the third question. Okay, the third question is a guardian Wen from University of Electronic Science and Technology of China. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for your wonderful talk. How about the degree of homogeneity of the transparent electrode uh, prepared by liquid assembly? And what are the difficulties in transferring this uh, transparent electrode from silicon wafer to target substrate? Okay, uh, thank you for this question. So this relates to the the, 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 the silver, uh, the, the, the conducting nanomaterial that is floating on the water air interface and then transferred to a transparent uh, uh, grid. So uh, as everything that we start in R&D at the beginning, it's a manual work and uh, uh, there's not much reproducibility, but the basics have been uh, elaborated and uh, uh, nothing stops in principle to make a scaling up uh, tool that allows to do uh, uh, this Langmuir blood, lung bludger type of transfer on a full wafer scale and even larger. I and mean, this is, uh, can be established. And, uh, and then the uniformity is, uh, is, is very high because uh, once the lung blood shot film, the floating film has been compressed, uh, it is uh, relatively uniform um, if everything is uh, done under uh, control. And then one can expect also that the transparency or the, uh, the amount of transferred material is uniform across uh, the surface that is being uh, studied. But I do not know more about the status of uh, of scaling up and controlling. This has been done uh, in, in uh, two years ago, uh, also in collaboration with the Peking University. So maybe um, if you look at the paper that has been published uh, on that, you may look if other papers have been cited this work and then see what is the new progress in this area. Okay, thank you very much. Now let's move to the fourth question uh, from Singapore and the EU, uh, Mr. Wan. Uh, thanks for your wonderful talk and amazing publication technology. I see that several of your students have their uh, startups. Are they collaborate with your lab or transfer IP from EPFL? <laughs> That's very practical question. <laughs> it's a it's the it's a very interesting question, and um, uh, of course. Um, EPFL has a very proactive attitude. It's very proactive in in, in uh, helping uh, young uh, stu young students or researchers to uh, create their own company. So uh, there is a, we have a tech tech transfer office that uh, uh, helps us to uh, to, uh, to define a collaboration. So in principle, um, there's a lot of support that EPFL uh, still gives to startups at the beginning of their uh, phase. So they can still 
uh, have um, access rights to the labs. Of course, everything must be uh, written in a contract to have uh, clear rules. Uh, and then there is some um, uh, fees that are being have to be paid. But so if the if there's IP that is being generated from students, um, the students uh, remain inventors of the IP, but the owner is EPFL. And then later on, if there's a return uh, as a license fee or uh, of this uh, patent, then all the inventors also. Um, get something in return besides EPFL as an institution and the, um, the laboratory. So there's depends really on case by case, but uh, there is um, a lot of possibilities that EPFL uh, offers for startups that are coming out from more labs. So there's also a website that uh, like, that shows all the uh, possibilities. If someone is interested in learning more, then send me a mail or go to the EPFL website and check for the tech transfer office information. Well, how many startups from your, your own lab? Yeah, um, four or five maybe. Um, oh, really I'm not nice. involved myself, uh, but I'm sometimes staying uh, as an advisor, mm -hmm. but uh, I think four or five at this time. Very great. Okay, let's move to the last question. Uh, I, uh, oh, this is Alice from PKU, the great professor. He, she also thanks for your wonderful talk. And uh, she saw many examples in your talk are in biomedical field. Is this will be the future trend for MEMS and trans users? Excellent question, Alice. I, it's, if, if one knows the answer, um, then you can become rich now. But... Uh, I feel like, um, you know, the application in, in biomedicine is really, um, is really present. And we see it now these days again with the coronavirus uh, pandemic situation. Uh, we need uh, much more knowledge about the uh, life science aspect and not just um, the pharmacology, but also um, uh, about uh, biomedical devices. So, and, 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 uh, and these are the most challenging ones to fabricate. I don't think in the future uh, there will be, um, I mean, there will still be some uh, needs in automotive and IT, of course. I mean, quantum computing will come and will need uh, lamps and transducers to, uh, to operate, you know, at low temperature. But personally, I believe uh, uh, the humanity will benefit a lot if we can invest all our brain and our uh, smartness in developing new devices and approaches to solve uh, pressing needs in, uh, in healthcare and, and these are the biomedical fields. So I'm pretty confident that in the next decade will be, will be very uh, uh, interesting in that area. Yeah, I totally okay. agree with your idea. Okay, let's finish the, the, the questions. And I think we can pass the uh, acknowledgement to certificate to Jürgen. Thank you so much. Yeah, Alice? thank you. Yeah? Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. I, I wanted to add also to ask your questions. Because you are chair for MAPS, con of MAPS conference and transducers, so that's why I asked your questions. Because many students here, they, you know, this is your talk. They want to know what's the future field. Yeah, what kind of will be the trend for moving on? So, yeah, uh, thanks for uh, answering my questions. <laughs> we're, we're very interested and beautiful slides. I love your slides. Yeah, Thank it's you. really, really beautiful. So, Jürgen, it's my great honor to deliver this, you know, certification to you from ICANX Talks and uh, X Lessons from PKU. Uh, we really like your talk and technology. This will connect the world and the universe. And uh, Jürgen, that's for you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, next time I met you, I will deliver this to you, you know, face to face, the hard copy. This time you receive my electronic copy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. A wonderful host. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Everything. Okay. Now we'll go to the end of this uh, ICANX talks. Yeah. I go to, you know, give several, uh, the highlight here for the trader of ICANX talks, you can follow us. 
for the YouTube, I got all these show, the videos on YouTube, you can get on replay. So uh, if you uh, didn't uh, listen a uh, whole part, you I uh, easily, you know, to follow all on this. And uh, today we're also doing an online survey. So uh, yeah, please copy this page and uh, you can go through that to, you know, feedback. Your feedback is very important for us because we want to know what you are going to hear and what's important, uh, what's interesting, you know, for you. We want to, you know, get to the super uh, scientists here and to get the latest result achievement here. So I want to hear more from you. So please scan the code or you just, uh, you know, copy this and, uh, you know, put it in your laptop and uh, the uh, website is, uh, you know, go directly to the, uh, to the survey. So it's very convenient. So please feel that and the feedback. I need that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, be sure, you know, to return that. Uh, no problem, it's always online. I can see that uh, on time. So, but I need your feedback, okay? Uh, so that's my advertisement and we're beginning. Then now we go to Call for the Mind 2020 Young Scientist Award. So Yoga and uh, uh, Professor Tabata, you are here. We need you to help to promote too because this was not only for the, you know, uh, superstars like the senior scientists, we also want to get more young scientists. So get to more people moving in, get the high, uh, get a highlight for the young scientists. So now we're calling for this, uh, you know, young scientists award. We want to get many candidates from different places. So yeah, please try promoting your network and uh, all the people's, you know, our audience. Now today we have, uh, you know, th uh, 350 audiences, so, a thousand audiences. So that's large numbers. I think it's the first time we talk to, you know, uh, such a big, large uh, audience. So we're proud of that. So we're going to, you know, catch more young scientists on the stage. Uh, since uh, at the July, at the June, we will have two sessions, special session, and we can, and Friday, the first week of Friday and June is for the My Young Scientist. So that's the winner for the last two years. So we will get them on the stage. All of them are doing wonderful job. All of them will have, you know, outstanding, you know, achievement. So, uh, uh, we want to, you know, have a listen to all these young generations. And uh, the second week in June, it will be Rising Stars from ACS Nano. Uh, so I choose three of them. Meso Kim from Korea. Uh, we got from Caltech, Nan Shu Lu from University of Texas and uh, Austin. So all of them are, are really rising stars. Yeah, they are doing wonderful job. They are very, very kind of uh, 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 good speakers. So please stay with us to listen to all these uh, rising stars. And uh, that's all pictures for our, you know, uh, lectures. So yeah, we got a lot of candidates here. We got super, you know, speakers here, scientists here. So stay with us on the IKX talks next week. Will be two very interesting story come out here. Liang Binghu, who just published the paper on science for his Ooh, nanotechnology. And uh, Jin Long was from Tianjin University. He is doing nice work for the artificial leaves. Yeah, as was very attractive topic too. The guest host will be Xuan He Zhao, uh, who already uh, delivered his talk on the IKS tax, but uh, that has a lot of things to share. He will be our guest, uh, you know, uh, prof uh, host next week. So stay with us, stay with IKS tax. All the nice the stories, excellent, you know, science and technology, the super scientists on this stage. So stay with us, and the next week, you know, we we'll see you again. I can ask the talk. So see you next week. Uh, bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Nice bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay, that's the end of today. Bye bye. 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 Bye bye.